There's been a big debate about the Lord's Prayer. Part of it is because it's a man's prayer. It's to a man. It's what historians would say patriarchal. Uh, It's very dominating. Our Father who art in heaven. Nothing about moms, nothing about aunts, nothing about sisters. And so we have been experimenting in this congregation. Say the words closest to your heart with the Lord's Prayer, which drives traditional fundamentalist people and even me nuts. Because after a lifetime of saying a key prayer that's in the actual Bible the same way, having everybody saying something different just becomes a babble and there's no uniformity for heaven's sakes. And there's no happiness in the worship about it. It's not easy. You can't stop thinking and just let it roll off your lips because now people are saying different things and you have to actually think. What a catastrophe. It's not a catastrophe. I think of it as a growth opportunity for all of us. Because even if it's written in the Bible, we've already realized that there are many different translations of the Bible. And the prayer remains fundamentally true to the initial story, doesn't it? It's got the gut feeling to it that, yes, it's an intimate prayer that we are praying. We're saying it at the same time together. There might be some fumbling with the words, but we are not actually at corporate prayer. God is listening to the individual praying. So you don't have to cross your fingers as you say the Lord's Prayer with somebody else's words. You don't have to get all huffy. I don't. I try not to. Sometimes I'm successful. Back to that sermon on sin. Um, But we need to realize the fundamental truth of the Lord's Prayer while we're saying it. The whole intent is talk directly to God while you're praying. Say these words because they're easy for you to say, but bring your whole self before God. So there's another mountaintop moment that is referred to today, Matthew 17. Here we have God revealed. Here we have Jesus revealed as God's actual son. And this is a small gathering. Three disciples, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, and God, and a cloud at the top of a tall mountain. And here's the key thing about that message. Here we have the holy people, the select, the elect, the heroes from biblical history, and the disciples who are most key to Jesus, and they're taken to the mountain, and you see the transfiguration. The voice comes down from heaven. Jesus lights up. The cloud lights up. It's a magic moment. The apostles are terrified. They go down on their faces. That's probably not the only thing that happens to them, but they go down on their faces, and they don't want to really be part of this until Jesus comes over and basically taps them and says, Hey, guy, it's okay. Get up. Come on. It's all right. Peter has seen Moses, and he's seen Elijah, and he's seen Jesus transfigured, and he's just so excited. This is classic Peter. He's kind of like the teen football captain. He's just so excited. Here they all are. Let's stay here forever. I'm going to make three booths for you, and we can stay here on the mountaintop because it's perfect. Key lesson is, Peter... You don't stay on the mountain. You've got the message. It's a corrective message, but it's got to be lived out in the valleys. There is nothing for you on the mountaintop. Nothing. Mountaintops are not supportable environments. The people who get to the top of Everest know this. They've used up almost all their oxygen. They're tired. They're cold. They can barely put one foot in front of the other, and they've reached the top of the mountain, and you can't stay there. You have accomplished whatever you have come to accomplish. Life happens among people. People don't live on mountaintops. So when we have the transfiguration and we have Jesus having been proved to be the Son of God, that's the moment. That's the corrected moment. Now we know what Jesus is. Now we know why he's on his way to Jerusalem to be slaughtered. But from that point forward, the apostles know, ah, yes, This is God actually reaching out a finger among us. This is my God showing me that the person I will have faith in is truly his son, is the Savior. That's the power. And now you must leave the mountaintop because that message can't stay on the mountaintop. It's got to go in among the living people. It's got to spread among them. It's got to bring up new blossoms like spring is about to bring up new blossoms out here. And none of that happens in the remote fastnesses. Why is this important for us? I think this sanctuary is wonderful. I think it is an 
wonderful and comforting and holy place, and many amazing things have happened here. People have been transfigured themselves here. And it's not just that beam of sunlight that just had Don Lorimer in it for a little while there that sneaks across and picks out a face and makes them glow for a moment. People have had lives change here. We have wept here together and we have laughed here together and we have sung together. We have had concerts. But this sanctuary in its own way is kind of a mountaintop. We come here to get something. But if we keep it in here, it doesn't go anywhere. This is not a place where people live. The people live out there. The people live in our neighborhoods and communities. So it's very fine for us to come to the mountaintop and get the message and feel happy and sing the right hymns and not fall down and have the organ be good and have the chorale sound wonderful and fill out our pew cards and put in our two cents for the day. But that is not the life we are called to. The real life we're called to with our wonderful message and our true understanding and our revelations in the Bible and our translations and our words, those are the people who we see every day. That's where we're supposed to be. And we're not supposed to be praying loudly in front of them or blasting trumpets to show how you're supposed to contribute. We're supposed to be in there working with them. We're supposed to take that mountaintop message that we have and leave this place and bring them back to it for the next message. That's my translation of it anyway. So again, I'm wary of words. Words have huge meanings and they have big connotations. I'm delighted at corporate worship. I'm always happy when I know the words I'm supposed to be saying, when I get into a prayerful mood and can just sit there and let my mind wander. And I'm threatened when things change. I'm threatened when my Lord's Prayer goes away. And something else that begins, holy one, comes out. Or somebody else has trespasses instead of debts. That threatens me personally. But it's a moment that also makes me think. It's not a comfortable moment, but it makes me think about what faith I'm expressing and why I'm expressing it. What we're expressing together as a people and how we should relate to one another. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that it doesn't really matter if every jot and tittle in Matthew came from the Apostle Matthew because there is a fundamental truth behind the laws that are being given. And there's a fundamental lesson behind the way it's being put to us. And we fundamentally need to rely on those gut truths behind the text in the Gospels. In Luke, the Sermon on the Mount is the Sermon on the Plain. That used to bother me a lot. I work with a lot of public relations people. I can see how scribes over time could change this text to make it sound more relevant or be easier to say or fit the liturgy better. That used to bother me a lot, and I'm wrestling with that now. But the fundamental truths remain. And the fundamental truth, as far as I can see in the summary of all of Matthew, is not only does God love you, he's willing to take you to the mountaintop and give you a course correction so you can be a better person to live the life you're meant to live in faith. You're meant to have sustain. You're meant to have a wonderful life. You're meant to obey the laws as you understand them. You're meant to be Jesus' person, and you're meant to be together in faith and in words. That's the Greek message that I read in English, translated for me. And it's still a wrestling match sometimes, but I'm awfully glad to have this manual that tells me how to behave. Amen.